Welcome to the 224th episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Toffel. And we have a stellar show for you today. We are going to be talking about the latest in Z-Wave Plus version 2. What does that mean? We've got some bad news on the medical front, as I'm going to say as per usual. Plus, I just tried out the wise light bulbs. I'm going to tell you a little bit about those so you know what to expect. And we've also tried out the wise people detection. Whoop, whoop. Plus, we're going to be talking about some trad free updates, Nest Hello updates, a new device from the ADT Life Shield program, and Google's developer preview of local home control is now live. Also, I tried out the Amazon Echo Auto finally, and I will tell you all about it. We'll also hear from our sponsor, Dell Technologies. It's actually Intel going to talk to us this week. And our guest this week is Gunit Bidi from Relayer. And he's going to talk about basically financial engineering for the IoT and getting around this whole CapEx, OpEx thing when we start selling everything as a service. It's fun, complicated, and you will want to listen if you want to know what's ahead. So, Let's get this party started with a message from another one of our sponsors. This week's sponsor is a Pharaoh. Are you doing multiple IoT projects that are going to work well together in a single app to strengthen your brand? It's all really tough, so it requires the right platform. And a Pharaoh is the one to choose. With a Pharaoh, Kenmore launched 42 smart appliance models in two years. Afero customers have experienced as much as an 80% reduction in time to market, 99% fewer support calls, and 10x higher activation rates. Plus, they can reuse 90% of their work from one project to the next. Pick Afero just like Kenmore, Mitsubishi Bank, and D-Link did, and beat your competition with a solution that your team loves to build and your customers love to use. Learn more at afero.io slash go big. All righty, let's get excited, Kevin. So first up, let's talk about the new Z-Wave Plus version two certification. Good Lord. For those of you guys who who are like, what? Z-Wave is one of the connection technologies we talked about. It's like ZigBee in that it's a mesh network and it is... Well, is it proprietary? I'm going to say yes. The chip company that makes Z-Wave chips is Silicon Labs now. They they bought the company that originally made them. And I like it. I have lots of Z-Wave gear in my house. Most people seem to be moving away from it, but it's still out there and it will probably be out there for quite some time. So this is basically the latest update. This is for anything built on the next generation Z-Wave platform. What this has is Smart Start. It is now required. And Smart Start is where you buy a device and you can connect it automatically. It's pre-registered for your existing Z-Wave network. So if you buy something from like Amazon, it will connect to your device that's already in your home. So yay on that. Do you have to scan something? I think... um, You do. Sorry, you do scan. Yeah, there's a QR code, right? The other thing it does is it allows you to have a light. So all of these devices will have a device identification through an LED light on the product to confirm to people that the hub is correctly set up and pairing and that sort of thing. This sounds silly, but as someone who has installed and reinstalled many a Z-Wave device... I can tell you that that light is actually really helpful. I have these Jasco outdoor switches and that you just press a button and you're like, I hope it's connecting. I don't know. And when you have the light, like when I'm pairing to my Wink Hub, which does have a light, I'm always a little bit more relieved when I'm pairing to something that doesn't. I'm just like, hope and a prayer, guys. You just don't know what's happening at the time. You know, the app that you're using to maybe pair this device, it's like spinning and spinning. There's no notification. So this is a huge, huge benefit from a setup process. Exactly. And 
this is the second version of Z-Wave Plus. And Z-Wave Plus came out in April of two years ago, actually. And that was all about security and securing your Z-Wave devices. And this is the Z-Wave Plus version 2.0. It continues with that. But basically those two things we talked about, which is allowing you to more easily set up these devices is what's happening here. Yes, they call it Smart Start. Yay. Everything needs a name. It does. And why not one that sounds a lot like some of the other smart <laughs> smart start efforts. Okay. So look for that on all Z-Wave devices coming soon. Okay. More fun. Let's talk about scary hospital news, Kevin. Yeah. It sounds scary on the surface and it's not a good thing, but I don't think anybody's been actually hurt by this. However, a healthcare security firm, CyberMDX, has reported that the protocol in certain GE devices that are used with uh, anesthesia and respiratory machines can kind of be hacked. It's actually very easy. Homeland Security here in the U.S. actually released an advisory saying that the flaws just require low-level skill to exploit. Basically, if you know your way around a terminal, you know the right commands, you could silence alarms on the machines, you could alter records. And this is the scariest part of it, although, again, no reports of anybody being hurt. Um, you could actually change the composition of aspirated gases in both of these devices, which, I mean, I guess you could make somebody sleep a lot longer or... You could you could actually kill them by... I didn't want to go there, but you could probably do that by removing all their oxygen. I am the evil one in this, in this duo. <laughs> yeah, so uh, not good. GE has actually said that, yeah, it knows about it, and they said we determined that the potential implementation scenario for such a hack doesn't really introduce clinical hazard or direct patient risk. I don't know about that. I think they need to do something about this. Even if they do something, the medical is a tough because medical devices, even if the device manufacturer, so GE in this case, fixes it and issues a patch, mm -hmm. hospitals may not actually download the patch. In talking to both CISOs at hospitals, companies in the medical device space, I am kind of appalled at the lack of rigor around patching in there, I know for a fact that there are unpatched vulnerable devices in many U.S. hospitals. I actually talked to somebody on the show a few months back from a security firm who told us about a hospital that discovered one of their infusion pumps was hackable and that there was a vulnerability out there that people were exploiting and they had to actually put a nurse next to the patient who had that particular pump on them at the time. They mistakenly used that pump, and so then they had to have a whole person sitting there making sure that the patient didn't die, which that is not scalable. So, yeah. The only good news, and I'm trying to make some good news out of this, the gas density hack is only on anesthesia devices sold prior to 2009. So that's a good thing. However, I know that devices don't get updated like every year in a hospital as well. So I'm sure there's a bunch of these still out there. Oh, yeah, easily. All right, well, let's move to something more fun. Let's talk about WISE. There's two big updates from WISE. One everyone got or everyone should have is the availability of person detection. Kevin, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, I, I actually just updated the firmware on my WiseCam, and I should say this is only for WiseCam version 2 or the Pan Cam that they sell. So if you have the original WiseCam, you do not have this feature. But once you update your firmware, you get a new option to enable person detection, which is powered by, you say it, Stacey, because I I don't want XNOR. to pronounce XNOR, X N O R dot A I. Yes. This is on device person detection, which is awesome. Something more at the edge, more machine vision at the edge. So I have a wise cam, obviously, because I updated the firmware and I get tons of notifications. So many that I turned it off because the motion detection trips the notification system all the time. And usually it's just a car driving by my house 
I don't care really, frankly, about that. I do want to know when there are people around my house or walking up to the house. And that's what person detection will do. And in fact, you can even just hit a button in the Wise Cam app and just only see person notifications and events, which is awesome. So I'm not going to be flooded with them. I'm turning my notifications back on solely for person detection. Well, and you know what you can also do? They have an away mode and a non away mode. You can also organize your notifications by that. So if you're in non-away mode, it won't send you anything because it assumes you're home. But when you click away, it sends... I'm really never away. <laughs> so well, that is true. That, Kevin that, that, never leaves that's, his house. That's just me. So, But you're right. For people who have normal lives and leave the house every day and come home, yeah, that's probably a good idea. But for me, I want the notifications all the time because I'm always home. That's right. And if you're looking for people around your house, this makes much more sense. All right. I like it. Yeah. So that's free. Just enable it on your Wisecam. The other thing is I was one of the early purchasers of their smart bulbs. So I got those yesterday, actually. And I paid a total of $41.40 for four bulbs. The That includes shipping and tax, right? Yes, tax and shipping. Your list price is going to be $29.99 for four bulbs. And these are tunable white bulbs with dimming. So I set them up. They're Wi-Fi enabled. So you can just have... I don't even think you need a wise camera. I wouldn't think you'd need anything. I mean, if they're supported by Madame and the G, then you should be okay with that. Yeah. So mm. it just occurred to me. I'm like, I have a wise camera. So I just was like, oh, la, 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 la. But when I set it up, it was just a straight up install Wi-Fi bulbs. So I put the bulbs in. They are lovely. The light quality is good. The dimming quality is good. I don't get flicker when I'm dimming down to the lower levels. Did you hear any humming? Oh, that's a good question. Mm. Let me see. Oh, we can check right now. We Let's all listen. Right now. I don't hear any humming. Yay. So no humming, no flicker. You can group your lights. You can do some weird scheduling. So here's the thing. This is early access. I think everybody will be able to buy them at some point soon. So I'm hoping we see a little bit more refinement here. Right now, I can turn the lights off or on after a certain number of hours, but I can't schedule something like days and times. So that's a little mm, weird. For weird. Me. And it's like, turn them on X number of hours and minutes from now, not like turn them on at 8 a.m. So I'm like, uh, 8 a.m. would be 23 hours from now. So that's bizarro. But they do let you do scenes. So you can set your, I created a bright day and a warm night scene. So, and then I can activate those by talking to my Google Assistant or Madam A because WISE integrates with both of those. The other thing I can't do that surprised me, I have the WISE Sense sensors, and I was hoping to be able to do a motion detection because this is a much cheaper option than like my hue motion detection. So I was hoping to do it so like when the light, either when motion was detected or when a contact sensor opened and closed, I would be able to turn the light on and then also have it turn off after a certain number of minutes. But I can't do that yet. Is the <laughs> I was like, because, sounds good, doesn't it? Because the sensors are not yet communicating with the bulbs, and I don't know. They can't be a trigger event for anything but a notification or turning the camera on or off. Right now, I can do vacation mode, and if I turn that on, it's going to turn my wise bulbs on and off, so it looks like I'm home which is nice. Mm -hmm. I find it weird that that's called vacation mode and isn't part of away mode. But, you know, I'm just going to roll with it because I think this is early. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have early access and the software and firmware updates just were updated to support this. And also, it sounds like there's still things in the works. Um, you could, according to what I've read, you could use the motion sensor with IFT. Yes. 
I'm trying to simplify my life here, people. I am not. I'm done with complex. You know, native, native is always better, and we'll talk about why in a little bit. Actually, with another one of our topics. So let's move on. Little bits of news. So Nest, hello. Yeah, this is interesting. Um, Nine to five Google routinely looks at Android app packages. Basically, the software you install is called an APK file. They open these things up using Android Studio and other bits of software, and they look and see what's coming because Google will usually put certain bits of information in there about future features to prepare for them. And the one they found was package detection, which I love this if we get it. Package detection for Nest Hello. And what this will do according to the data that's currently in the Nest Hello app, or the Nest app I should say, is it will tag your Hello doorbell footage when it thinks a package was delivered and or picked up. So that's very cool because sometimes I get, like I said before, notifications, too many notifications, say, from my cameras when one of them was actually very important to me, meaning a package was just dropped off, but I can't tell the difference between that and all the other noise. So this sounds awesome. Um, It's not sure if this will come to pass or when it will, but it looks like Google is actually working on it. Yay! Again, smarter infrastructure. So yeah, that- you'll need a Nestaware subscription, just so you know, for this. Ah, blah. Just, blah, just blah. saying. Never mind. All right, <laughs> moving on. Let's go for a cheaper, a less rich option. IKEA's trad free. <laughs> I can't do it, you guys. I'm sorry for all the IKEA people who listen or the Swedish people who listen. Trad free. I can't do it, but I'm trying. Okay, so what do we have from the IKEA folks? We have some new products, new trad free products, a filament style light bulb. That's either A19 or E26. A19 is the normal light bulb size that you're thinking. A26 is, I don't even know what that, what is that? It's E26. Oh, those are the chandelier normal bulbs. Yes, yes. So the bulb uh, is $16, has three different color temperatures. So it's tunable, but only tunable to three different temps, unfortunately. 806 lumens of brightness, obviously works with the trod-free system. Also a candelabra E12 base color and white light bulb. For twenty dollars, yowza, that's expensive. Candelabra and bulbs are always expensive. I know, I know, but they're so small. You should be paying less, but that's a whole other topic. Anyway, and one other interesting—I'm going to say this wrong—one interesting product: the Float F L O A L T. Maybe it's Flow Alt light panels. They're similar to what maybe like Nano Leaf makes, but they're bigger. And don't have all the cool, fancy features that Nano Leafs can have. But basically, you can get a square light panel, 12 by 12, for $70. If you would like a two foot square light panel, it's $129. And then finally, a 12 by 35 inch panel, also for $129. So again, three different color temperatures warm glow, warm white, and cool white. Nice. Though I think with those kind of light panels, I think the colors are super fun. But that's because I use mine as an art installation and not as like functional lighting. Yeah, we have the microphone as well, which so the light panels change colors based on what it hears. Rhythm. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I should tell you the wise light bulbs are 800 lumens for the people who are counting their lumens. So they're Mm -hmm. dimmer than this, but they're cheaper. Yay! Much cheaper. Those the wise are not home kit compatible, but the trod freeze are. Ah, good point. All right. Brighter, home kit compatible, but just the tunability is truncated? Oh man. Mm, yeah. Slightly <laughs> slightly tunable. Slightly tunable. Fully dimmable, but slightly tunable. All right. So next up, also doorbell news. Exciting doorbell news. If you are a member of the ADT Life Shield, which is ba- program, which or is it program? I don't really know how to think about this. Life Shield is a DIY program from ADT that lets you buy products, connected products, and do monitoring and that sort of thing. So they have released a new HD video doorbell. Yay! It has two-way audio. 
It has people detection, woo. It has 180 HD resolution video, 170 degree wide lens. That's actually pretty good. Many stop at 135 or 140. And you can get notifications and whatnot. So it's not cheap. It's not cheap. How much is it, Kevin? It's $200. Yeah, um, that's, that's pretty much. I mean, the Nest Hello is, isn't that 249 yeah, it is a little more expensive, but it also works with the Google system and so on. And yeah. Oh, right now you can get the Nest Hello for one eighty nine. Ooh, there you go. Oh well, there you go. So if you want to, if you want to tie the doorbell to anything with the Life Shield HD video doorbell, you have to use if this then that. You can't really do much else. Yeah. So if you've already got your own system, maybe go with either Ring or. Nest, depending, depending on Amazon or Google. Yep. So yeah. it pains me to say that. Depending really on does. Amazon or Google. Yeah. Depending on who you want. But speaking of Google, let's talk about local home control. Yes. And this gets back to what I said earlier about uh, native on device type activities at IO, Google IO, back in May, they showed off the, or announced, I guess I should say, their local home SDK. And basically what that does is it's a way for device makers in the Google ecosystem or Google Nest ecosystem, if you will, to allow local processing of smart home commands read states and so on. So what that means is instead of going out to the cloud every time to process language and commands, which can take some time, it'll all happen basically on a Google home device. So the preview is out now. They've already announced the early partners, which is GE, LifeX, Philips Hue, TP-Link, and Wemo. None of those partners have announced any local home support yet. Um, although I'm sure they got access to this before the developer preview went live this week. So hopefully very soon we will see local home commands uh, with a fallback to the cloud in the Google Home ecosystem. I'm hoping, I'm going to see if I can find some time to try and access one of the APIs for one of these device makers and actually test it and time the local versus the cloud-based commands. Nice. All right. If it's anything based on like Google's local voice transcription, that is so much faster and it's it's so cool. Yeah. So I'm I'm yeah. very excited. All right. And now I, thanks to a wonderful listener, thank you, John. I have been testing an Echo Auto, which I had wanted forever because I wanted the Amazon Echo in my car. My car happens to be a Tesla, which does not play nicely with a lot of the other Android. It doesn't play nicely with Android Auto or Oh, what's the other one? CarPlay? CarPlay. I was like, Apple's something. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like really excited because I constantly, I have questions. Like I'm thinking in the car and I'm like, oh, what was that? You know, what date was that? That the, you know, battle of... How many teeth does a cat have? Yeah, just just silly questions. <laughs> I, I don't, my mind just never sleeps. <laughs> so it shouldn't sleep. I'm driving. Okay. So I've tested this out. It works basically from your phone. So it creates a constant Bluetooth connection to your phone. And what it does is it allows you to do calling, send text messages, and it has all the basic features of Madame A. So I can ask the weather, I can ask commute times, I can ask how many tea the cat has. <laughs> so all of that is available now in my car. And it also hooks me up to Spotify. And granted, I had this in my car because I have a Bluetooth connection to my phone. But it's really cool because in my and I drive a Tesla. So in my Tesla, I can say, I press a button on my steering wheel and I say play, pick a song, Con Altura by Rosalie. And it will play that sometimes. It's a little <laughs> iffy. It's a little fussy. And it doesn't work from Spotify. It works from a different service. I can't recall the name of the service that comes with the Tesla. But now I just say, Madame A, play Con Altura, and it will. You don't have to have to hit the voice button on your steering wheel for that. I don't hit the voice button. And it's pulling from Spotify, which is right. 
awesome because I'm already like, I prefer Spotify to whatever the Tesla has because it doesn't always play the song you want. Sometimes it plays something close to it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was really excited. I'm loving it. The downside, the cost, the cost is not the downside. It's 25 bucks. The downside is I'm having trouble. So it only works when my phone is in the car paired to it. Amazon says I can bring in another phone, like my partner's phone, for example, and it will pair to his phone. It basically connects to the last phone that was in the car when Mm -hmm. both phones are present. And to pair it, you're supposed to be able to say, Madam A, pair. That does not seem to work at this moment in time. So we have not been able to pair it yet to his phone. Right. But theoretically, it's possible when I figure out why this isn't working, I will let y'all know. Or if you have paired two phones successfully. I don't think that's a huge issue, though, because typically, if it's your car, you're the primary driver, you want this Echo to be connected to your phone. If I'm a passenger, I can open up my Madam A app and hit a button and do all the same things. And I'm not, I'm not driving. So... I don't think it's a huge issue, but maybe others will disagree. I just think the seamlessness is nice when you Mm -hmm. you can just walk in and it works for you. And we also share, like if you share a car, which we do, because we've got an electric and a combustible, not a combustible, what's that called? Gas vehicle. ICE. (laughs) ICE. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we tend to drive the electric vehicle whenever we can, so we don't have to get gas. But that's just us. It's a yeah. little specific, but you know, I know there are lots of people who do share like a minivan with all the car seats in it. Those people probably don't trade the car seats out all the time. Anyway, know that going in, when I figure out how to solve that, I will let you know. It'll probably be up as part of my exhaustive review. So stay tuned for that. Okay. And Kevin, now I feel like it's time for the voicemail. What do you think? I think so. All right. For those of you guys who are curious, this is the Internet of Things podcast hotline where you call us and ask us your questions and we pick one to answer. When we listen to it, we're also putting you in the running for a Schlage lock. So you can call us and be entered to win a Schlage lock at the end of the month. We will pick a winner. So give us a call at 512 623 Seven four two four, and maybe you'll have a chance to win. The hotline is brought to you by Schlag. Schlag's wide variety of smart locks lets you create the smart home of your dreams. Learn more about Schlag's smart home solutions and compatibility with Amazon, Apple, and Google products at schlag.com/iot. This week we have a question from Jerry, who's looking for a smart button. Let's hear it. Hi, Stacey and Kevin. Uh, this is John from Ohio, and it's okay to play a message if you want. I'm looking for some kind of button that's compatible with smart things um, just to activate a theme. I know we can use the Echoes to do this, but sometimes it'd be nice just to have a button on a wall. I know Insteon has something similar with a bunch of buttons you can program, but I'm not sure I've ever really seen anything compatible with smart things. Thanks a lot. Bye. All right, Jerry. Actually, you already have most of what you need because you said you have smart things. And if you want a, a button for scenes, Samsung actually makes a smart things button. It works obviously natively with the smart things hub that you have. It costs $15, which is not too expensive. And you can program it to do whatever you'd like. It could be for scenes. It could be for turning lights on and off. It could be for anything that you would like to program. So that's Actually, the way I would go, I originally had thought about the Fabaro button just because it's a really nice looking button. It looks more like a button to me, but it's not natively supported that I know of. You may have to install like a separate device handler for smart things for that. So I probably wouldn't bother with that. I would just go out and spend the 15 bucks on the, uh, on the Samsung smart things button. You can even have a bunch of different actions on it. Like a double click does one thing, a single click does another, press and hold does something else. So one button can do multiple things for you. I was going to offer an even more expensive option just because that's me, especially if you have a lot of things. This AOTech, they make a lot of lovely Z-Wave stuff. They sell a Z-Wave button that is their Minimote 2. It is $45. 
but you can control eight scenes from it. If you have eight whole scenes and you don't want to buy maybe three of the smart things buttons, actually, that's the same cost. So I really don't know why you would buy this. Let's just go. There. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm really flummoxed. But if you want a smart button, that is a reliable smart button. I have used it and it works really well. <laughs> and controls lots of scenes. Actually, the problem I have with smart buttons is a lot of them control many scenes and then I kind of forget what I'm supposed mm -hmm. to do. Like four clicks plus a right click plus a left click and a shake turns these lights on. So, I just go with voice. Yeah. But That's why. <laughs> this one is rechargeable. So you can either recharge it via a USB, which is nice, or there's a battery. And I don't know about the smart things one if it's rechargeable, but you could end up buying a lot of batteries because using a smart button is fun and you tend to run out the battery. And I think I've run out my battery on these in about six months. I don't believe this is a rechargeable battery. It's a CR2450 battery that you have to replace. So those are your options. I mean, there's tons of Z-Wave buttons out there. There's tons of Zigbee buttons. But yeah, if you have smart things, you have that. So enjoy. Let us know actually what you get. I'm curious. I'm curious if anyone buys the more expensive buttons. So, all right. That feels pretty good for this week's show. Please stay tuned for Gunit Bidi, who is going to talk about how companies who are trying to sell their products as a service can match their revenue streams in the future and the role of insurance on the corporate industrial IoT side. So, all of that and more is coming up after a message from our sponsor. Hey, everyone, we are taking a quick break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Dell Technologies, and I have Craig Wetzel, who is director of IoT channels at Intel, here to talk to you about their relationship with Dell. So Intel works closely with Dell Technologies as they've been building their edge and IoT business for the last few years. How would you describe that partnership? So the Dell and Intel relationship has had a long history of success. Starting with the first PCs that Michael Dell created in his dorm room, we've worked together on desktops and servers and, and converged infrastructures and cloud solutions. And together along this journey, it's been very tight-knit and close. And now we're moving into the IoT world together. And this engagement with Dell is a critical one, specifically when we collaborate in new markets like IoT. Dell has their seven individual companies, and Dell is able to use the technology to create function-specific capabilities that can be brought together to make complete list solutions. As you know, IoT solutions aren't created using a single specific product. Solutions are created by different layers of technology and products coming together, which allow a customer not just to collect data, but use it for business decisions. With Dell, we have partnered with an organization that has the key infrastructure and capabilities to which our partners and customers can add their analytics and other pieces to make a complete solution. Can you give us an example of where Dell and Intel have collaborated to deliver a solution into the IoT market? Actually, let me give you two examples of our joint engagements. In one case, Dell and Intel worked together with a large U.S. city to implement a situational awareness solution that will allow the city to implement a matrix of compute components from cameras to servers to collect and analyze data. Those analytics create actions that provide, one, a safer living and working condition for residents, two, better management and planning for infrastructure improvements that reduce pedestrian and vehicle traffic, and three, provided additional analytic insights that were needed to make better decisions by the city's urban planners. In short, the collaboration improves the lives of the city's residents today and for years to come. And the second reason? Dell worked with a U.S.-based entertainment company to develop a solution for their golf experience. This solution allows a golfer to analyze their swing real-time and make adjustments immediately on the driving range. This example of collaboration by Dell and Intel enabled this U.S. retailer to provide cutting-edge experiences for their golfers and customers. And what does Intel see as the main barrier of adoption in the IoT market, and how are Intel and Dell working together to break through that barrier? We see an incredible interest from companies, but almost all of them are struggling with how can we turn data into actionable information that drives meaningful business outcomes. We are working with Dell to deploy solutions that allow for analytics to happen where it matters, while it matters, and often this is at the edge. By moving analytics closer to the point of data collection, it reduces latency, improves real-time responses, and relieves demand on network bandwidth. 
Thank you, Craig. And where can we go to find out more about the packages that Intel has created for the Internet of Things and what they're doing with Dell? Check out these offerings as well as many others on DellTechnologies.com slash IoT. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham. And this week, I will be joined by my guest, Gunit Bidi, who is Chief Revenue Officer at Relayer. And hi, Gunit. How are you doing? Hey, Stacey. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me here. And I'm, I'm excited to talk to you more about the industrial world. Let's kick it off with a quick, hey, what is it that Relayer does? Relayer um, is an industrial IoT software and technology company, but you know the software and technology that we produce is very tightly coupled with insurance and finance solutions, which you know kind of sounds weird when you <laughs> when you hear about it. But I think what we've seen, is, especially in the B two B world, a lot of customers are trying to solve a problem on how do they really go to market with the connected product, and that's really where we help. So the combination, which I'll talk more about, of insurance, finance, and technology allows the traditional industrial companies to really think of new revenue models with connected products, such as you know pay as you go or going from a capex to opex sale. We do this a lot with mid market companies. That's really our speciality. We used to be a venture backed startup for almost five years. But now we're a fully owned subsidiary of uh, the largest reinsurance company in the world, Munich Re. Let's talk about Munich Re and give us an overview about Munich Re and why they acquired you. So I think when we were in the market um, you know, raising money, as any good startup should do, we raised our first round with the traditional venture capital, which is Kleiner Perkins. But then, you know, we thought that, hey, we need more industry insight. And that's when actually um, Hartford Steam Boiler or Munich Re, you know, the U.S. arm is Hartford Steam Boiler, which I'm referring to HSB going forward. They invested in us and said, hey, you know, if you can really make things smart, we have <laughs> three to four million different industrial things that we would love to make smart and get intelligence so that, you know, we can write better insurance policies. So things like boilers, you know, CNC machines, a lot of equipment, just compressors, pumps, motors that are used today, um, you know, kind of go to Hartford Steam Boiler and say, hey, give me a equipment breakdown insurance, which means, you know, Hartford Steam Boiler actually is an engineering company, which I did not know before they invested in us. You know, they have 1,500 plus PhDs who actually write models to understand equipment failure. But of course, all these models pre-IoT are based on historic data and based on averages, right? So from their perspective, if they could really get real-time data from these assets, starting with Wunder Bar, but now with better solutions, that would be really great to them. So, you know, they kind of partnered with us for three years, really liked what we were doing, and then said they acquired us to be kind of the nimble IoT arm. So we're still independent from a decision-making budgeting perspective, but we have the luxury of having the credibility and the balance sheet of the big insurance company focus on, you know, kind of how do we help the other industrial companies to do similar equipment breakdown. And that equipment breakdown, insurance, we call it, um, led to equipment as a service, which I can cover more. But the initial rationale was just to kind of get real, data from these connected products to make either insurance better or prevent failures before they happen. All right. So let's dig into that because the first thing I would think of when listening to what you do is why do we need an insurance element here? I mean, in a lot of ways, this is a deal between two companies. This is the equipment provider saying, boom, here you go. This is going to work. And when it breaks down, I'm going to know in advance. So I will send someone out proactively to fix it. And so it feels like a two-party relationship, but adding insurance, why does that need to be in there? The first element of where the risk prevention happens from an insurance perspective is when the equipment manufacturers are actually going through the journey of connecting a product and making it smart and connected. They're not sure if this will work and they're not sure if they should invest money. And that's where delivery warranties are almost giving the peace of mind for these equipment manufacturers that they can go through this digital transformation and this will work. We can get data out of really old school machines like motors and pumps and you know boilers. It gives them a lot of confidence to do IoT and digital transformation. The second place where insurance helps is for them, where, you know, the manufacturing equipment provider can go and say, hey, I'll I'll service this equipment and I will guarantee you uptime. But, you know, because it's new to them and it's new to their customers, there's somebody else who's actually saying, 
you know, if the equipment fails, we are so confident that if the equipment fails, we'll actually pay you money for the breakdown of the equipment or even the interruption in your business. That's really the two areas where insurance comes and, you know, helps in the IoT journey. Excellent. So we are going to get to those examples in a minute, but let's dig into one of the elements here, which has always fascinated me, which is this idea that if I am a a small to medium sized manufacturer and I'm making a, a pick and place machine and now I'm selling it as a service, what happens is I'm taking something that used to be a big lump sum payment And now it's going to be paid out over time. And if you're Amazon and doing something like that, or one of the big companies, maybe you have the capital to do that. But if you're a smaller company, it seems impossible. You can't turn a product business into a services business overnight. The costs of making the product and then your incoming revenue stream just don't match up. So is there a way for you guys to help in that situation? Absolutely. I think you're spot on, Stacey. I think, you know, from our perspective, uh, first of all, why should the as a service subscription economy only be for the Netflixes and Spotify of the world, right? If they could disrupt an old school records market, you know, we're saying that, you know, why not disrupt every other market? But of course, the big challenge which you talk about is these are expensive capital equipment, right? So when we're going after expensive capital equipment, like you just said, I get a big check up front of the equipment sale. The disadvantage, of course, is that I only get that check maybe 10 years uh, later again when they need to upgrade the equipment. So it's kind of weird that I don't, don't touch my customer for 10 years in the middle and I lose all that revenue. But still, you're right. I mean, I still have a challenge that I was making a million dollars up front for a heat treatment plant or heat treatment equipment. And then suddenly I'll start making, I don't know, 200000 a year, which is great over 10 years, but it's not great up front. Because we're owned by a very capital heavy or you know, large balance sheet organization, we have some balance sheet re-engineering tools. So what we do is we take the assets of these manufacturers in our books, but still create an OPEX revenue model for the end customer. Uh, and you know we think this is temporary. Like you said, you know once the customers see this working, they get the money up front. And of course, you know there, there is some cost, but they understand that the market will expand because the End users will still get this offer as an OPEX. They will just not get it through them, but someone like us, which is a distributor, almost in the middle. And then, you know, two years, three years from now, when they see the sales happen, they can probably make that switch. The good news is that a lot of companies which are mid-market are not, um, you know, publicly traded. They're private. So although cash is a concern, is not as much concern to show a revenue dip and explain it to the market. But yeah, uh, I mean, that's that's how we've been solving it. You know, we kind of come in with the concept of, of course, technology. Nothing happens without getting this data out of these um, machines and equipment. But on top of that, we can do some balance sheet re-engineering to give them, you know, the OPEX model transition, if you may, and still get that money up front, either from us or from a leasing company. And on top of that, we can ensure the uh, uptime. So, you know, when they sell this as an OPEX, um, you know, our customers can go and say, if for 100000 a year, I'll give you the heat treatment plant and I will guarantee tough time. So that becomes a very compelling value prop for the end customers for them to grow their sales. Excellent. And one of the things that I thought was really intriguing about having you guys involved in, in the financial insurance side was how it helps make small to medium sized businesses a real player in this market. Can you elaborate maybe by giving an example? One of the examples close to my heart is this small company called Coborn. It's a public case study. They're based in the UK. This is a company which sells very specialized CNC machines for diamond polishing and grinding market. These machines cost anywhere from 300 to 400,000. A lot of the end customers use this either for gemstones, but also the Foxconns of the world use it for cutting all the screens. It's all your iPhone, Apple Watch, etc. The screens are cut with uh, very high precision diamonds. So there's a high demand in the market, but their challenge was twofold. One, they sell this machine and they have almost no aftermarket sales. And second was they were missing out on a smaller target segment because you know, smaller vendors sometimes don't want to pay that 400000 up front when they don't know their market opportunity. So Steve, uh, the MD and us, we've created an offer now where Coborn sells Coborn Care on top of the machines. And that Coborn Care is where these machines are retrofitted or added with the sensing capabilities of remote data collection. We create some predictive algorithms on top of that, which is sold as a fixed price service per year. But in certain versions of that, we also guarantee the uptime of their Coborn machine. 
to guarantee the uptime, guarantee the performance, and give the end customers a penalty, for lack of a better word, if the machine goes down. So that's the first way they're kind of going to market. But on top of that, they're saying, hey, you know, if you have Coborn Care and Coborn together, instead of buying a $400,000 machine, we'll give you this machine for 6000 a month, right, for base utilization. And we're kind of doing, like I said, the financial engineering of taking these Coborn assets up front, either our or leasing company's books, paying Coborn 400000 but the customers pay five or 6000 for base utilization. Everybody makes money if uh, they use more. But also in this 5000 the IoT plays because we guarantee the uptime of the asset. And besides guaranteeing the uptime of the asset, we know exactly how much the machine is being used, which is the other beauty of having you know, an IoT-connected product. So that's how Coborn is um, getting into the market with a combination of just a aftermarket revenue with services, which was never there before, as well as coupling that with a OPEX model to really expand the market. So let's talk about elevators. And you guys are helping some of the smaller operators on the insurance side. So can you talk to us about what you're doing there? Yeah, on the elevator side, it's interesting. The smaller service providers, not the top fours, but, you know, who service a lot of the older elevators after the contract with the Otis or Ashinda expires is our target segment. From their perspective, when they're servicing these elevators, one of our customer services, 30 to 40,000 elevators in the German market. And, you know, of course, there's a big challenge of how do they effectively service this and efficiently service this without going there all the time. So we've helped them create both a retrofit kit as well as a, you know, IoT solution to analyze anything going wrong in the elevator before they go there. But more importantly, besides uh, going wrong, there's also a compliance angle in, in Germany, uh, which says that, hey, you know, you need to inspect an elevator at least once a month to make sure it's running okay, uh, which is kind of scary that in the U.S. it's once a year. <laughs> but uh, at least in Germany, it's every month. So, you know, just having a solution which can do that digitally or remotely really helps our customers in the service uh, provider space. And on top of that, what we're just starting to do is if our service providers can go and guarantee the uptime of the elevator, especially to a hotel or a hospital or an airport, saying, hey, you know, if you buy my service because it's IoT enabled, I I will guarantee the uptime and make sure seven of your eight elevators are running all days. And if they don't, I'll pay you a penalty. And that's penalty is where the insurance company comes in and takes the risk on their books. So that's how we're going in the elevator space. It's, it's a little less about as a service, but more about how do you enable better services of these elevators with, of course, IoT, but also backed up by insurance so they can really confidently sell uptime without worrying about uptime. And if a failure does happen, hopefully our algorithm spot it. If not, the insurance backs them up. Okay, so you have had a lot of experience in building out revenue models for the IoT. What are some takeaways for small to medium-sized businesses who are looking at this and are saying, man, how do I get in on this? What are the questions they should be asking themselves? How should they be looking at their business if they want to try to implement this? You're right, Stacey. This is really hard. It's not an easy question to answer for everybody. But the first thing we are seeing as a trend is that if our customers' customers, so their customers are seeing macroeconomic issues or they cannot uh, place large orders of equipment, and then this becomes very interesting. So a good example is the automotive sector. You know, the automotive sector, the Fords and the BMWs are going through a big transition and, you know, they cannot forecast call cars anymore for eight, 10 years. So all the suppliers, the smaller suppliers which supply to these automotive guys know that this will actually resonate with their customers. So, you know, make sure there's a market, uh, I guess what I'm saying, before you try and do this. So we have heat treatment as a service, for example. We have wire cutting. We're working with a company called Leone, which does all the cables for robotics in the automotive space. But all of that is only working because the automotive customers are feeling the pressure and then they like to get new revenue models. So that's number one, you know, just kind of see if there is a there is a market. And the second thing which we're seeing is it's really hard to do this without stakeholder alignment. <laughs> so all that sounds very soft and we're not talking about the, you know, edge and the AI and the technology. But besides the technology, we had to do a lot of consulting to get, you know, the IT team, the services team, the operations team kind of together. 
uh, and works only if the C level is kind of you know really engaged and motivated to do this and committed to do this. So that's the two big learnings we've seen. Find a market and then make sure you understand that this is not easy. It's not just putting a sensor and putting it in the cloud. Excellent. Yes. And I think it's important that we have this conversation because we talk a lot in the show about the technology, but we don't talk about the financial and the economic things that you have to get in place to make this a reality for your business. So, Gunit, thank you so much for coming on the show this week. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. This was a great conversation. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at stacyoniot.com. We'll see you next week. Thank you.